Before the earth was divided into regions, we were born with all our differences. That's what you call differences, honey. And we're supposed to take care of one another. It's beautiful, right? As time goes on, views and values towards something develop, whether they're good or bad. Divide them. Oke, pegang baik-baik layarnya supaya tidak putus. It will make them stronger. This is who they are. Isn't it so much better than how you thought it would be? Mother Earth It's radiance It's greatness Its beauty will never fail It's amazing. I want to feel this forever. You always read the truth without needing to say anything.
even the development of modern life can never break them. Because they are one. Hey son. From the deepest part of my heart, standing here beside them isn't just about the journey, but it's also about the feeling. Feeling that will never run out and will never be faint. But she will keep seeing and finding new wonders here. Wonders that are priceless. Feel the wonders and finding where we feel the most alive. For me, it's here, this land will always be. The more you feel, the more you know. Thank you. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Selamat pagi. Annyeonghaseyo. We are delighted to welcome you to Indonesia-Korea Youth Friendship Forum 2020. How to bring your country in the middle of global crisis. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Saskia Salsabila from Strategy and Management Program in Indonesia Youth Foundation. And I will be your master of ceremonies for today. It is, my, it is my pleasure to welcome you here this morning and I would like to thank you for joining us today for this special grand webinar. With this opportunity, we wish we could develop stronger and sustainable relationship between Korea and Indonesia, share understanding from other views about how can we improve the image of our country after the pandemic COVID-19 and spreading awareness of the importance of youth so that they can take a part in building the nation. Before we begin, I would very warm welcome to the Excellency Ex-Ambassador of South Korea for Indonesia, Mr. Kim Changbom, the Honorable Executive Director of Center for Peace and Public Integrity Hansen University, Professor Yi Ki Ho, the Honorable Economist of Fiscal Policy Agency, Ministry of Finance, Republic of Indonesia, Ms. Adelia Surya Pratiwi, Master of Science. Before we proceed the forum today, we would like to thank you to our media partners, Bumi Scholars, PPM, 
and Scott Time. This event, supported by Hansen University, Korea Democracy Foundation, and organized by Indonesia Youth Foundation and PPDC. Ladies and gentlemen, let me inform you our agenda for today. And the time shown in the event rundown is using Jakarta time. Seoul, South Korea, it's two hours ahead of Jakarta, Indonesia. Now, 10.31 in Jakarta and 12.30 in Korea. So our rundown for today, first we have opening Indonesia-Korea Youth Friendship Forum by MC, followed by welcoming remarks and keynote speaker, followed by opening grand seminar for session by our moderator, and followed by Korean expert, Professor Yi Ki Ho, and then we have break session for 40 minutes. And we have in 12.30 p.m. Jakarta time, and second and 2.30 p.m. Korea time, we have opening second session, followed by Indonesian expert speaker, and we have closing ceremony at 1.10 p.m. Jakarta time. Ladies and gentlemen, during this grand webinar, please kindly open your camera and turn off your microphone. At this time, we are now opening this grand webinar with the welcoming remarks by Ms. Yim Dabin, the President of Peace and Public Diplomacy Corps. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Yim Dabin. Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Uh, thank you. As our MC introduced, my name is Im Dabin, President of Peace and Public Diplomacy Corps in South Korea. I'm sincerely honored to meet you in 2020 Indonesia Korea Youth Friendship Forum. First of all, I would like to thank to every general participants and expert speakers which allowed this forum to be meaningful and diverse. Without your interest, it would be impossible to realize this forum. And of course, I want to thank to other members of Indonesia Youth Foundation and Peace and Public Diplomacy Corps, which have tried so hard and cooperated to realize a rare moment in which both young generation from Indonesia, Korea, and other countries to share their thoughts and pursue progress. After COVID-19 situation, all of the countries, including Korea and Indonesia, are going through a really rough time. Economy situation is getting worse, a lot of people are losing their job, and of course, we can't enjoy our daily lives as usual. During the national crisis, the weak points of countries are appearing on the surface. It is why we have organized the forum under the theme of how to brand our country under the global crisis. Global crisis is of course a disaster and tragic event for everyone. However, we should not stop on the face of being sad. We have to change this event as a new precious opportunity. Therefore, I think 2020 Indonesia Korea Youth Friendship Forum could be the big turning point, which can broaden our viewpoint and make us to look around our society again by making conversation with each other. Most of people would agree and argue that young generation is really important and precious resource for a better future. But why? Why? should we pay attention and study about peace, freedom, environment, democracy, and social values? Why is it important? I think it is because we don't want to repeat the historical misjudge and mistake. However, if we start to be concerned about society after actually becoming the main generation, it will already be too late. We have to share our voice from now and prepare for future from now. Everyone has their own problem of life in case of young generation, majority of them, including me, is having hard time to decide our career, to make our efforts and prepare for them. Nevertheless, those shouldn't be our excuse to neglect about politics and other social problems. 
regardless of our personal life, the environment which we live in for now and will live in and for less of our lifetime is our society which affects our life even when we don't notice it. Criticizing about current situation is of course important but it show, because it shows that we are concerned about our society and have understood about current situation. However, we shouldn't finish at criticizing. We have to think about the fundamental cause of social problems, make our own value system, and keep trying to make a new solution. Since there were others who sacrificed and struggled, nowadays we can live in the society of developed democracy, freedom, and equality. Of course, the change of society is very slow, and sometimes we might think that we are even moving backward. However, there are actually some slow but obvious changes and I think accumulated small steps and works eventually make those changes. In that point of view, I think this form could be one of those small steps and works. However, to make this relation between young generation of Indonesia and Korea or any place in the, or any, of course, other countries to be permanent and productive, I would like to ask you to keep in touch with each other and keep paying attention to both country situations. I hope next time we can meet in person in Seoul or in Jakarta or any place in the world. Terima kasih. Thank you for listening. All right. Thank you so much, Ms. Kim Dabin. So next, I'm continuing to the next speech. I would like to invite the president of Indonesia Youth Foundation, Mr. Fauzi Wahyu Zamzami. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Fauzi. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Hello, everyone. Annyeong haseyo, hashim nika, Your Excellency, Mr. Kim Changbom, a former ambassador of South Korea to Indonesia, the Honorable Professor Yi Ki Ho, the Executive Director of Peace and Public Integrity, Hanshin University, the Honorable Ms. Adelia Surya Pratiwi, the Economist at Fiscal Policy Agency, Ministry of Finance Republic of Indonesia, the Honorable All Presenters, Committee from Indonesia Youth Foundations and Peace and Public Diplomacy Corps, and all participants whom I live. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Fauzi Ohi Zamzami, a founder and president of Indonesia Youth Foundations, a non-government public diplomacy organization which focusing on promoting a better understanding of Indonesia and bridging friendship with the international community. First of all, I would like to say thank you to everyone who interested to this forum and share a lot of information and happiness. Second, I would like to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart to all outstanding speaker, Mr. Kim Changbom, Professor Yiki Ho, Ms. Adelia Surya Pratiwi, and all presenters. Without them, this forum would be very quiet. Third, I would like to say a thousand thanks to the member of Indonesia Youth Foundations and Peace and Public Diplomacy Corps for having the pleasure to make this event. Fourth, I would like to say a thousand thanks, especially to my friends, Jim Dabin, who give us the chance to have a collaboration with Peace and Public Diplomacy Corps. Actually, I and Dabin met at the event called Civil Society Education Network in Asia, and we never imagined before to create this program. But as long as there is an opportunity, why not? In this day and age, everything we do is very different from before. People who usually go to school face to face now have to be online. And of course, they cannot interact directly. People who usually sell and are busy with the buyers now have to struggle more because of the lack of buyers and other things that I cannot mention it one by one. The COVID-19 situation changed our life, but should we just give up as the youth? I don't think so, everyone. As a youth, we can do many creative and useful activities. One of them participated in the Indonesia Korea Youth Friendship Forum 2020. You use your best time to learn how to burn your country in the middle of global crisis. As we know, global crises such as COVID-19 make the image of country 
including Indonesia and South Korea, how come the economy, tourism, education, and other sectors were affected, which of course become a challenge of the country image itself. Therefore, this forum will invite us as the youth to think and discuss how we as Indonesian and Korean youth can restore the good image of our country in the middle of this pandemic. I really hope this forum is able to provide the good solutions for Indonesia and South Korea. Moreover, I really hope that this forum can bridge the friendship between Indonesian and South Korean youth. Indonesia and South Korea certainly have good relations and almost the same history. Of course, South Korean entertainment industry in Indonesia is very well received. I also like it and learned a lot from there, especially from Korean drama. South Korea is very famous in Indonesia with K-pop, Korean drama, so that Indonesian students in South Korea are in the ninth rank for the most students in South Korea. Hopefully, with this forum, we can mutually understand conditions, culture, languages, and other aspects of Indonesia and South Korea. At the end, I really hope that we can hold this forum directly, both in Korea, Seoul, or Indonesia, Jakarta. Finally, um, as the president of Indonesia Youth Foundations, officially open this forum. Thank you so much for your great attention. Kam Shamida. Thank you very much, Mr. Fauzi. And ladies and gentlemen, we are now continuing to the next agenda, that is to hear the keynote speech. In this session, we will have a Q&A at the end of the session. You can send your question in the chat box or feel free to ask directly to the keynote speaker, but please use the right hand feature before you ask the question. We are going to hear the keynote speech, which will be delivered by Mr. Kim Changbom, ex-ambassador of South Korea for Indonesia. Uh, good afternoon. Selamat pagi. Uh, di salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Uh, di saya uh, Kim Chang Bom, uh, mantan uh, duta besar Republik Korea untuk Indonesia. Saya sudah uh, kembali ke uh, Seoul, Korea, uh, bulan uh, Juli uh, yang lalu. Uh, senang sekali uh, bertemu dengan uh, semuanya. Uh, saya hampir merasa uh, saya sekarang uh, adalah di Indonesia. Yeah. I'm very delighted and honored uh, to deliver a keynote speech at uh, Indonesia Korea Youth Forum. Uh, I'm particularly pleased uh, to meet with all the young leaders from both uh, Indonesia and Korea, even though it's uh, in a virtual manner. I would like to uh, express my thanks to uh, both Indonesia Youth Foundation and Peace and Public Diplomacy Corps who have jointly organized uh, this uh, meaningful event. Under the current global pandemic, the focus of every country around the globe is to overcome the crisis in the best way to save as many lives as possible and to minimize its economic impact. However, it's not an easy task. It's actually a huge challenge. Regardless of their economic level of development, the form of governance, almost all the governments are now struggling to manage and respond to this unprecedented crisis. In times of crisis, it's extremely important to have coherent strategy that guides today and also give the right direction for tomorrow. When it comes to national strategy for tomorrow, it envisions national brand and national strategy for image building. Today's topic, how to brand your country in the middle of global crisis, is extremely relevant and timely as we are in the middle of global fight against this coronavirus pandemic. For the next two days, both Indonesia and 
and Korean young millennials will have chances to share their insights and wisdoms with each other on how we can improve the brand and the image of our respective countries after the pandemic. How can an intangible asset such as national brand be effectively used as well as to be a solution to a crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic? How can we find practical ways and means to translate such national branding into actual policies on the ground? In case of the Republic of Korea, the government has placed three important values at the core of its fight against the COVID-19. The first, openness. Second is transparency. And the third is democracy, democratic values. It also put innovation at the forefront of its policy priorities. In my opinion, from the outset of this coronavirus pandemic, Korea's brand emerged as country of openness and innovation. I'm sure that you might uh, uh, have common and similar views on how Korea has overcome and still uh, in the process of uh, overcoming this uh, global pandemic. This brand strategy will continue to work even beyond this COVID-19 fight. Let's turn to Republic of Indonesia. Republic of Indonesia, things are a bit different. It's a huge population and a vast size of the whole country. I think Indonesia started its fight in a more difficult and more disadvantageous position in comparison with Korea. Indonesia is still struggling with a significant number of new infection cases every day and a relatively high fatality rate. In spite of such challenges, the Indonesian government is trying to come up with post-corona recovery and resilience package to cope with economic difficulties. The recently passed omnibus bill on job creation is one of the government's ongoing efforts to reactivate and revitalize its economic powerhouse. Economic recovery or resilience can be highlighted and converted into a more proactive term for the national brand for Indonesia. I believe this webinar is showing us a new way of collaboration and team building efforts by young millennials of both countries in order to explore future oriented solutions and insights for the post pandemic era. It is my strong hope that the whole discussions will provide answers on actions required in our common endeavors in the post COVID-19 stage. In conclusion, we should not, we cannot just return to business as usual after this pandemic is over. Take positive lessons from the pandemic experiences and adapt to the new normal. Think strategically and act boldly. I think that's for the future. That is the way forward. Thank you, terima kasih. And I hope to have some Q&A sessions uh, with the audience and all the participants. Terima kasih. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim Changbom. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to inform you about Mr. Kim Changbom's experience and contributions. Mr. Ambassador Kim Changbom is a well experienced diplomat. He is currently working as co founder and advisor at the newly established Center for Strategic and Cultural Studies, CSES Korea. He has completed his diplomatic career of 39 years in September 2020. He has served as Korean ambassador to Indonesia from January 2018 to through July 2020. During his career, he met 
significant contributions to the promotion of Korea's partnership with EU and ASEAN through summit meeting preparation and substantial progress in trade investment and people-to-people -people exchange. Wow, very amazing, Mr. Kim chang -bom. Thank you, thank you for your compliments. Yeah, and now we are going to the question and answer session. So, anybody who wants to ask a question? If you have any question, please feel free to chat via chat box or you can ask directly to Mr. Kim chang -bom. But don't forget to use the right hand feature. All right, so uh, we have the first question from Yim Debin um, to Mr. Kim chang -bom. From your international experience, what do you think is the most important role of youth generation? Well, this, uh, I think the uh, young generation uh, is constituting the main backbone of the whole society, and it is providing uh, kind of uh, middle ground for all the uh, uh, opinion uh, making process. And also uh, it is uh, going to uh, lead the whole nation uh, to a uh, future oriented direction. I think this, uh, uh, I, when I was uh, first hearing from uh, Imda Bin, uh, from uh, Peace and Public Diplomacy Corps, I was quite surprised to uh, learn that uh, there are some uh, exchanges already uh, building on between Indonesian uh, Youth Foundation and this uh, PPDC. Uh, uh, I think this, uh, when I was in uh, Indonesia serving as ambassador to uh, Indonesia, uh, I was uh, trying to uh, meet as many as uh, young millennials and university students and college students. Uh, and I even uh, made the Trans Java uh, bus trip. <laughs> called Dikonang Jawa in uh, September 2019 and visited uh, quite a number of cities and towns uh, within uh, uh, the Java Island. But I think this, uh, the more important thing is that the uh, young uh, millennials uh, between Indonesia and Korea can have a common platform to share their experiences with each other and to share their agonies and uh, kind of problems or even concerns and aspirations and future-oriented uh, visions with each other. This is the, the first ever that uh, I have, uh, I'm, uh, I'm getting to know uh, uh, as far as this uh, Indonesia, Korea, uh, young uh, millennials gatherings are concerned. Of course, this uh, due to uh, global pandemic, uh, both uh, Indonesian and Korean young generation are not able to uh, exchange, exchange their visits. Well, that's, uh, but I think there's a wet, uh, when this uh, global uh, coronavirus pandemic will be over, then you will have a chances to visit uh, each other's hometown and home campuses, and also to meet with uh, more friends. But I think this, uh, the, uh, in conclusion, uh, I think this most important thing is to have common platform to share ideas, and also to explore common uh, prosperity and common opportunities for the young generation. And there is another, uh, there are several questions now, let me just check. And uh, let me just go uh, first uh, to the last question from, uh, uh, I think this, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, Subek, uh, Subekti from Indonesia. 
The question is on uh, what is the most challenging in doing diplomacy and how do you face it? I think this, uh, under this uh, global pandemic, uh, the conventional type of diplomacy to meet with people, to engage uh, with the counterparts and partners face to face are not physically doable for the time being. So I think this, uh, we are now relying on so-called online and untapped for uh, cyber uh, context uh, with uh, partners and uh, counterparts uh, overseas. Uh, so that's uh, one uh, challenge that we are now uh, coping with. I think that's uh, uh, even though this, uh, this uh, webinar or the virtual meetings can uh, do uh, replace uh, some of the conventional type of uh, diplomacy, but it cannot substitute the whole array or whole kind of forms of diplomacy. So I think there's, uh, there are some uh, missing kind of parts in conducting the whole array of diplomacy. And uh, another important uh, thing is that uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, now increasingly this uh, summit meetings and ministers <coughs> meetings, this high level context are getting more important in day-to-day uh, -day diplomacy. But uh, as you know, there's uh, all the summit meetings uh, like APEC or G20 or uh, East Asia Summit, ASEAN summits are now being conducted all virtually. So no personal context, uh, no personal kind of uh, the, uh, experiences at all. So uh, it's quite uh, sad and pitiful that uh, uh, those uh, important part of diplomatic activities uh, cannot be uh, made uh, for the time being. And uh, the second uh, question is from uh, Chittadi Akbar uh, Adiyat uh, from um, University, Edgy University. Korea is a really successful in branding their country and example by their entertainment. You have big experiences as an ex-Korean ambassador for Indonesia. What's the best sector? For Indonesia to brand our country according to your opinion. Well, this, I have uh, many chances to chat with the Indonesian policymakers on uh, the success story of K Wave, Hallyu. Uh, uh, so uh, I was suggesting to Indonesian friends that maybe uh, next time Indonesia should come up with I Wave, Indonesia Wave. Uh, I pop or I drama or I film or I beauty, I halal uh, products, something that can be uh, globally attractive. Of course, that does require very concerted, coordinated efforts from both government and private sectors. I think this basically the content industry, entertainment industries are driven by private players, pioneers, and all the uh, so-called kind of uh, young and innovative uh, leaders. So that, uh, that should uh, be something that uh, Indonesia also can learn from uh, Korea. And I think there's so many things. There's, uh, there's another question from uh, Nick Ken uh, from Dari uh, Universitas uh, President. I want to ask especially about tourism related field, what kind of collaborative thing that has been done between Indonesia and Korea and how strategy related with youth participation in the tourism sector. There are any chance for youth like us to gain the scholarship related with tourism in Korea or vice versa? Yes. Well, this uh, tourism is now uh, the most hard hit sector during this uh, global coronavirus pandemic. I think this, uh, it might uh, uh, take some time for the tourism industry to, to be uh, returning back to uh, the track. Uh, for the time being, I think that uh, we have to first uh, and foremost uh, respond to and also tackle this uh, the fight uh, in, in this fight against the global pandemic. So I think that's, uh, well, in due course, uh, when this uh, global crisis will be over, then 
there'll be uh, more opportunities and chances for Indonesian students to get scholarship programs, uh, not only on uh, tourism, but also on other uh, Korean studies, Korean language courses, and others. Uh, there are quite a number of uh, uh, global uh, the scholarship program provided by uh, the Korean government and the Korean uh, public institutions. So uh, uh, please uh, refer to uh, www uh, study uh, in Korea uh, homepage that uh, that uh, will be giving you uh, a whole array of uh, opportunities uh, that will be available uh, for uh, uh, overseas uh, students. But of course, this uh, under this uh, coronavirus, uh, this pandemic, uh, it's difficult to get uh, any uh, chances uh, uh, due to the restrictions of travels. Thank you. I think that's uh, more or less. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cover the whole questions, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for all the participants who asked the question. But unfortunately, unfortunately we just have uh, the limit of time. So thank you very much for Mr. Kim Chang Jung for your. Okay. So now, uh, next, move on to our next session. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will continue to the next agenda, opening grand seminar for a session accompanied by Ms. Raini as the moderator for today. Ms. Raina Shazafira is an undergraduate student at the University of Queensland, Australia. She is currently in the process of completing her foundation program and will go on to major in international relations. She has had an active history in the Model United Nations circuit throughout her high school years, her most notable award being the most outstanding delegate of United Nations Women in ALSA EMUN 2019, held in Universitas Indonesia. She was also the recipient of the Chairman's Scholarship for the Chrysalis Young Leaders Conference in Australia 2018. Without further ado, I would like to hand over to the moderator, Ms. Rani Zafira. The floor is yours. Thank you very much to our MC, Ms. Saskia, for the introduction and the warm welcome. Before we begin, I would like to take some time to introduce myself. My name is Rainasha Zafira, and I am the coordinator of International Cooperation in Indonesia Youth Foundation. It is my pleasure to be your moderator for today's event. For our first topic of discussion, our expert speaker will be discussing about characteristical changes in Korean society under COVID-19. With the coronavirus sweeping lives throughout the world, many countries are implementing strict laws in order to crack down on the rising cases of COVID-19. These laws are changing and impacting lifestyles drastically, from the education and economic sectors to the mental health of individuals within societies. South Korea is no exception to this trend. Despite being known for their successful preventive measures early on in the pandemic, it cannot be denied that the presence of this virus still left an impact on Korean citizens in one way or another. Today, the Honorable Professor Yi Ki Ho of Hanshin University is going to talk to us a little bit about these impacts and shed some light on how they have created changes within the Korean society. Mr. Yi Ki Ho is an active professor at the Graduate School of Social Innovation Business and the Executive Director for Center of, of Peace and Public Integrity in Hanshin University, South Korea. Previously, Professor Yi worked as a Secretary General of the Korean Peace Forum from 2003 to 2006, focusing on peace and cooperation issues between North and South Koreas in the context of Northeast Asian cooperation. Professor Yi has also served as an advisory member of the Presidential Committee of the Northeast Asia Initiative during the period of Roh Mu Hyun government. From 1999 to 2002, Professor Yi was a visiting scholar at the Waseda University in Japan, looking at the local and transnational civil movement and its links to peace in East Asia. Before 1999, Professor Yi worked for 10 years in the Korean Christian Academy, where he focused on Korean political change and global peace networks. In 1997, Professor Yi completed his PhD dissertation titled Social Movement Networks in the Democratization Process of Korea at Yonsei University. Before I welcome our speaker, I would like to let the audience know that you will be allowed to ask questions to Professor Yi. 
To do so, please type your question in the chat box and they will be answered by Professor Yi after he has finished speaking. If anyone would like to ask a question directly to Professor Yi, please feel free to use the raise hand option and we will open the question and answer session. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming His Excellency, Professor Yi Ki Ho. Professor, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Okay, first of all, thank you very much. Terima kasih to all of you. And I really, really a pleased and honored and happy to see this a opportunity and to uh, be invited here. This is really wonderful a, between Indonesia and Korea, especially um, among young people's new initiative that could make kind of some great impact to work in more a good direction. So um, may I uh, share my screen? Is everybody can see? Of course. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, we can see. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Is it is it fine still? Okay. Well, I'm 15 minutes, so I would like to share about uh, three things. First of all, about the Korean situation, and second thing is about how uh, what is really changing in the world, not only in South Korea but also in Indonesia. And thirdly, I also like to say that then what would be uh, good lessons uh, and challenges that we have to overcome uh, through such kind of some circumstances. And I think there is a very wonderful lesson already inside in Indonesia. So I would like to uh, focus and highlight more about the Indonesian spirit that we had a better share together, especially among young people between South Korea and Indonesia. So um, I would like to say the first things. <clears throat> okay, COVID-19, um, basically we see COVID-19 is not only pandemics, but that's a kind of some of the outcome of what humankind has developed up to now. So in other words, we could say it is a kind of some climate change, which we have to uh, overcome or we have to transform and revolutionize about our lifestyle. So in some sense, COVID-19 would be a kind of virus to humankind. However, in other words, human ourselves could be a virus to planet and COVID-19 would be a vaccine of planet uh, against about the humankind's desires and some <clears throat> um, very greedy a uh, development. So this is just a question what we had a better think about. Uh, maybe you also needed to talk about which side you would like to stand on concerning about COVID-19. And um, this is kind of some the COVID-19 map. Um, actually, uh, this is dashboard we tried just to quote just the last night. So this is just a less than 24 hours, a graph. What happens here? If we could see usually the most in US America and South America and Europe uh, and India. Um, so we use, and even Japan. So even nowadays, this pandemic is usually a much more spread in the developed countries rather than developing countries. However, this that's why I already told you about this is not uh, only about the illness or some other a, the sanitary issues, but this is a kind of some the outcome of human development. So actually we have to think about the lifestyle which we have a, developed up to now. And um, if we just go back about um, seven months ago, well, the former, a the graph you could see um, the 11 million people are actually contaminated in US and then second India, Brazil, France, Russia, Spain and UK and Argentina, Italy. So actually mostly they are except India most of them are Europe and America but 
seven months ago, if we could see, uh, the number top one was China and South Korea. So actually, we were very much suffered in the beginning of COVID-19 that what happened. Well, concerning on this, I guess already a Ambassador Kim explained about how the Korean government uh, responded to or how Korean government made some policies to deal with this COVID-19. So I like to very a uh, speed up the Korean side, but at the same time, I'd like to tell you about the what is going on in South Korea uh, due to COVID-19. Well, actually, a this kind of new categorization of class is done uh, by a uh, <clears throat> the very famous um, the U.S. scholar and bureau uh, Robert Reichy. And he mentioned in Guardian early this uh, April. And according to his opinion, COVID-19 divides the society into four classes. The first class would be the remotes. The remotes are the people who can work separately through computer internet. So actually their job has not been so much influenced by this COVID-19. So for here, if we could see uh, this a picture, he's still working as usual, unlike <clears throat> the before the COVID-19 stage. And however, the second class, the essentials, for example, <clears throat> they do not lose their jobs. However, their worst, <clears throat> sorry, condition is too bad because they have to work more hard and there's some um, the heavy burden is done to them for example deliveries or some <clears throat> the doctors so their work condition gets much worse so that's the second class and the third class we could say the unpaid actually who lost their jobs especially the small stores the restaurants cafes where people are not allowed to get in uh, to be a to make some social distance. So most of them they lost their jobs. And we also have to think about the forgotten. For example, illegal labors, uh, the abroad labors, or the prisoners, or um, the young children um, who do not have their parents. And so actually uh, there are several people who are not protected even forgotten, so they are isolated, so there is no help. Um, so these kind of things also happened in South Korea exactly. So that is really going on. So for example, in Korea, um, the delivery workers, uh, nowadays uh, many delivery workers just uh, passed away because of the overwork, because they heavy uh, laborers uh, a day, uh, most of them work more than 16 hours, a day, so um, they overworked to, to death. So such kind of thing happens here. But anyhow, so this phenomenon is the same, but on Korea, we could say the accumulated, contaminated, a, the a patient's number is, today is just more than 30,000. So the number itself is not too big. However, the society is really a suffering as the same as the other country does. And if I could get more here, this is very a um, short story about how the Korean government dealt with the COVID-19. As you could see, um, the Korea would like to do a, the three key, first of all, the control strategy. They do test very, very quickly and they make a kind of trace the system so some countries also crit criticize the Korean, the information system because that sometimes um, do harm in keeping the, the personal privacy. However, well, I don't know how you think about, but Korean people, are, most of Korean people are positive in making such kind of trust system because they think the public safety and public sanitary is more important than private life nowadays. So actually, almost most uh, the Korean the citizens voluntary participation to deal with 
the COVID-19 is essentially important, I think. And then the government also uh, treat such kind of a COVID-19 very, very uh, effectively and, and, and promptly. So the 3T would be a kind of some our SMU policy and the principle, because we also had very bad experiences before, anyhow, we would like to make everything very much transparent. So very open. So we would like to share all the information, what happened and how the patient moved. So we trace all the places where he visited, where she visited. So we make a kind of some sensory system not only from the, a, the national government, but local governments also like do that. And people think that is also kind of some democratic values. So what the government says is also true here. And if I go one more thing, um, <clears throat> uh, the trust system, as you see, transparency, responsibility, and united actions, and science and speed, and together in solidarity. Well, you, if we have any questions, not only me, but our some South Korean students can also answer to your questions, or they have maybe different ideas, but we can share about. But mostly, I would like to say such kind of some five process and principles to deal with a COVID-19. We had a kind of some consensus uh, between government and civil society, I mean people, so transparency, responsibility, a united action, science and speed, and together in solidarity, we are in on the same page. So this is the, this is very a roughly say what COVID-19 has been dealt with in South Korea and what is outcome. So I already mentioned about we suffered still in the same a transition. However, uh, we made a kind of some quite successful a the policy and strategy to deal with the COVID-19 in this context. So um, let me go uh, next to uh, some other topics. Very important thing, one more thing I would like to emphasize here with all of you is we usually say Indonesia, South Korea, North Korea, USA, that is a state name, but COVID-19 this year let us recognize not only state, but also local life is really important. So this is a new recovery of local. So what is local? We have to think about. This is a very, very important, I think. And in this context, I'd like to say um, how we could make it successful. First of all, I, I already mentioned about the government side, but in the local side, I'd like to emphasize, the first one is about citizens in local. They a, made great resilience. Actually, a, they had patience. They also had a kind of a unity, solidarity, participation, voluntary engagement, and they themselves would like to make some many other some prevention policies in personal level, family level, local level. So not only the national government, actually citizens in local was very, very excellent. So I really like to praise all the local citizens in Korea. And the second thing, usually I guess a, Indonesia has a very complex history, but in South Korea, we have very strong national government. So usually local governments did not have their initiative. Even though we have a local government system, by law. However, local government could not make their own initiative. However, the, under this kind of COVID-19, local government it showed a lot of accountability and very prompt policy and very a, appropriate a contextual policy. So local government's initiative was very wonderful. So their policy focus and citizens' resilience, I think these kinds of things actually happens in South Korea in local level. So I also like to let you think about local and we had a better share about in local, even though we would like to a uh, build up Indonesia and South Korean, the young people's a uh, cooperation, but not only state level, personal level, local level, university level, or some your any organizations level, 
So we have to think about more local base. That's one thing that I also like to uh, emphasize for today. And so here, if we think about COVID-19 pioneered or opened a local space as a new RSM community base, then I guess it could give us a kind of some the a new Kairos system. I mean, game changer, a big a momentum to change the present situation up to now and about the future. So, uh, <clears throat> well, I roughly say I think we we have we had better think about a three the spaces. The one is about one is about the state. Uh, you already know uh, where we experience, but as I mentioned, we also found local as a kind of some new space. And third one is the cyberspace, as we already meet together in cyberspace through Zoom tool. And state is very old a uh, space. And actually, in the beginning, especially after 1945, uh, nation state was a very strong community to be against imperialism or colonialism. So nation state was a kind of some very a wonderful community to make their own autonomy. So the nation state would like to make a more strong solidarity. And at the same time, they would like to modernize the people and they would like to develop economics. So they would like to make a strong state. This is a kind of a state story uh, between uh, 1945 and up to now. So this is one absolute a kind of some space during the last 70 years. But at the same time, if we think about the new space, local, especially village, 15 minutes walk radius, but anyhow, local is a kind of a new community that we, we would like to focus on. And the other one is about cyberspace. If you could see the, this kind of some mobile phone, uh, you use a uh, most of your time in mobile phone. So mobile phone is not only communication tool, it's not only tool, it's a kind of some, your life itself, your space is over there. And um, then how we can find such kind of some, the spirit of local, I guess that is actually in Indonesia legacy, brand Indonesian spirit. Probably you already know Bineka Tugal Ika. I don't know if this pronunciation is correct or not, but uh, roughly say it is a unity in diversity. And over here, diversity means local, unity means a state. But, but if we could say the unity had better be more beyond the state, for example, planet, how we can deal with COVID 19? That's, in other words, how we deal with about climate change. In other words, how we can deal with about the planet, the Earth. So in some sense, I would like to say the Pantasila, the first principle, one God, we also think about one Earth, one planet. So we are all humankind. And however, humankind is composed by not only humankind, but also other Earth, air, sky, water, sea, animals, plants, etc. So that is a kind of some new way of thinking. And I guess the Pantasela first principle, and at the same time, this Bineka Tugal Ika gives us a lot of some, the spiritual, um, abundant, the energy and legacy and ideas. So I would like to emphasize once more about your, the Garuda Pantasela and uh, this kind of some Bineka Tugal Ika. And um, if we go back, how this could happen? I think I don't have time. So if you'd like to be interested in the Bandung Conference, Asia African Conference, which happened about 65 years ago, actually in the beginning, the founding fathers, the original founding fathers who have fought against imperialism, colonialism, they had a kind of some of the original ideas why they have to build up the solidarity among the people in the name of a nation state. However, the nation state has been very much distorted. They only see about the, the, the strength or some convenience 
also the globalization, etc. So we have to think about the new things under this kind of COVID-19. Well, um, I'm sorry, I don't have time to explain about the Bandung spirit and how it has been done, but I think this would be a kind of some, a new a task that we have to re-examine re and, and reflect and learn. So that's, that's very good, very good base of source and that happened in Indonesia. So I think this Indonesia and South Korean such kind of some meeting and this this kind of some conference is not coincidence. So I think there is a very long, long origins of our ideas and spirits. And now very young you youth will make a kind of some continuity history with such kind of some legacies and spirits. This is Bandung 10 Peace Principle, I'll skip out. Okay, so that's what I like to emphasize. However, however, the power and money, the state and global companies are very much competitive in Asia. What we need is not competition, rather, we need a kind of some cooperation among ourselves. But unfortunately, Asia is in very hard competition in, in such kind of some changing structures. You could see they would like to categorize in many terms. Well, if we could see this kind of some regional cooperation seems to be very wonderful. Of course, I also agree. However, among this kind of some the Asia initiatives, at least we could find they are very competitive still and they are very much economic oriented or some the security oriented and at the same time the main actors are only state how young people can engage in building such kind of cooperative uh, the regional community in that sense i think we had better go back to the more base the person family local village etc and actually i visited several times in Indonesia to investigate um, or to answer my question because Indonesia originally was very much localized, different uh, languages, different uh, races and different uh, religions. How such diverse and different locals can make a kind of some strong state? That was my question. But anyhow, it has been done in many ways. Sometimes a military coup d'etat, or massacre or militant the government force, etc. But anyhow, anyhow, we have to go back to the more basic our life world. So in, in Indonesia, originally the local base was the base, and how we can revitalize the local again, and then how we can make a kind of some more equal cooperation and more active, more voluntary, more bottoms up cooperation. So this is kind of some, my suggestion. So what youth will do? Well, I think this is a wonderful chance because we do not know each other well. We do not know about the past and future. So I think it is important to uh, make some literacy. So Asia literacy and the local literacy or history literacy. So we had better have some kind of some more a field base, the live a um, learning process, that is one. So, and second thing is a the field experience. Well, uh, the South Korean now students would like to make a core. core. Core means a kind of some the military, but it is not military. It is a very peaceful community to go the, to the field. So where is my field? where we can make a common field. So field experience is also important. And as we already do, even though we use a Zoom and internet, face-to-face -face solidarity is very, very important. So I think these three things had better be a kind of some of the key issues for the youth cooperation. And I think under this COVID-19, the cyberspace like this way would be more a good opportunity that we can make exchange. So even though this is first trial, I think this is a very wonderful 
the starting point, the beginning. So you could make new beginning here. That's why I would like to say uh, reflect re means it's not new. We already had experience. However, how we can make renewalize, revitalize, revolve, reform. How? This is it. Remember. Remember is to remember the past, but remember means we are, we became a new member, a new member. We, our membership is remembering. For example, not only belong to Indonesia, not only belong to South Korea, but youth can be a new members of this planet. So COVID-19 lessons and um, my expectations and wishes through this conference, what you could uh, develop more and what I also like to do with you together. So this is what I'd like to give you from my side. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Yi, for the very insightful presentation. As a reminder to the audience, if you would like to ask a question, please feel free to use the chat box to type your question. And if you would like to ask a question directly to Professor Yi, please use the raise hand feature and we will open the floor to your question. To summarize the presentation, Professor Yi has highlighted a few key points, the first of which is that COVID-19 divide, has divided society into four different classes, the remote, the essentials, the unpaid, and the forgotten. Korea's specific response to COVID-19 includes emphasis on, on voluntary participation of citizens with the health protocols, which translates to local-based initiatives, the creation of three different spaces, state space, local space, and cyberspace, and the emphasis of the trust principle, which includes transparency, responsibility, united actions, science and speed, and together in solidarity. Professor Yi has also emphasized the importance of the youth in having local and historical literacy, building solidarity, as well as gaining field experience as an exchange for the Asian community. Now we will move on to the question and answer session. For anyone who has a question, please type in the chat or raise your hand. Okay, for the first question, we have from Gilan from Diponogoro University. Um, thank you, Mr. Yi, for the clear insight. I want to ask you some question regarding the matter. How could the youth help to gain awareness between the isolated population or the forgotten population, as it is one of the issues that Indonesia faces? Well, I think um, such a kind of your some own personal experience is important. However, uh, we could not do it because of COVID-19. So the travel or going or some living some other places for a half a year or two years. So I think that would be a very wonderful experience to expose yourself in strange place where you would like to uh, live or where you'd like to know. So I think that is a thing that you could do. And the other thing, um, as you already did, you, we need a kind of some conversation dialogue. What is really going on? and how what, what is happening over there so i think this opportunity even though we do not talk much but we 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 have a kind of some feelings of what what is really a new and what is i don't know so i think such kind of some the encounter among yourselves the meeting face to face is very important and the other one i also like to suggest this is a little bit ambitious so i'm not sure you had a better think about why you don't want to make a kind of some invisible but very solid the common university among yourselves for example between indonesia and and south korea we don't need any building and you just to make a kind of some one one workshop curriculum and if you make a kind of some the programs accumulated and then later i think there will be a kind of some the archive a new a very vivid and alive, a library like, and you make a course, and that will take a little bit long time, but time goes. So now maybe you are 20 years old, but 10 years later, you will be 30 years, and the other young generation will follow you. 
So you had to better make a kind of some the, the cooperative a, a relationships among yourselves. So you had to better be feel free from the fixed concepts, uh, the things that you have you are very much accustomed to up to now. So bring your ideas again. What is my university mean? What is my family? Sometimes nowadays in South Korea, uh, not blood related a family, but social family is also important. So we usually say urban nomad life because the people like to make a new family. Maybe it, it is not permanent. So you have to think about everything a, in, in new ways. I think that would be a kind of starting point. Then I think Indonesia, South Korea, such a distance will not be a big matter, but you can make a kind of some new bridges, new spaces. Okay, that was a wonderful answer, Professor. Thank you very much. Um, our next question is from Ms. Choha Kim. Um, hello, my name is Ms. Choa Kim, a student majoring in political science and international studies at Yonsei University. What do you see as the most urgent problem besides COVID-19? Maybe transitioning from localized to state, and what could be the ways youth can be involved in tackling this problem? Well, I don't know the other countries, uh, the impact of COVID-19, but concerning about the question, I think um, people's the psychological, the health is really a big problem nowadays in, in Korea. Of course, physically, it is important not to be contaminated COVID-19, but people are almost locked down and their life, it does, their social life is almost gone. Even in, well, well, in Korea, it is relatively, it is fine. However, the young people could not go to university nowadays because every class is done by cyberspace. So actually they lose a lot of other opportunities to make a girlfriend, boyfriend, or some the hobby. So actually a, they lost what they sh had better do in their ages. So, so that gave, gives a lot of stress. So I think people's life is very stressful. Then people are very much easy to get angry. So I think such kind of things a very much a, a risky um, in maintaining our society more happily and more smooth. So I'm thinking not only physical a uh, sanitary issues, but our some the mental or psychological or spiritual, the health is really important now. So we also have to think about um, how we can make a kind of some new relationships under this COVID-19 rather than only lockdown. Even though physically we are locked down or locked out, but we would like to think about how we will be connected together and how we can connect together. So that's what I mentioned, the new space, local and cyberspace. So over there, how we can build up such kind of new spaces. Originally, it, 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 it used to be there in your life. And the nation state is actually um, only 70 years, maybe, maybe, if even if it is long, it is only two or three hundred years. But local life and family life has been long. Of course, cyberspace is really totally new one. So very old local place and very new cyberspace. We had a better build up new things. Sorry, too long. No, it's okay. It's completely fine. Um, our next question: We have a raised hand person here um, from Warsito from the Indonesian Cooperative Institute. So he would like to ask a question to you directly. So to uh, Arsito, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Warsito. I'm from Indonesian Cooperative Institute. Uh, as I read that South Korea started the economic based on community. Uh, uh, actually, Indonesia have economic based on community, but it's still decrease. Uh, I want to know from Mr. Ki Hao Yi, uh, how, what is the suggest from you to uh, the Indonesian to increase uh, economic based on community? So we have uh, to help the, the global, global community. Uh, thank you so much. 
Okay, well, um, as I already mentioned, the way of thinking had better be a change nowadays. So when you ask about economic development, what we, we need a kind of new definition. What is economic development? And economic development makes you happy. Is, is it true? Or um, so, uh, well, usually I think the Western society dominate about the discourse and knowledge and economic development, um, the process and the goals also usually done uh, by Western society. So usually a Indonesia and South Korea, such kind of middle power a states would like to have a, a policy catch up strategy. But now we don't need it to catch up. We had to better develop our own ideas. So rather we think about how we will make economic developments, but we had to better think about how we will be more happy. So what would be the index of economics or development? But at the same time, we also have to think about index of happiness. And the index should not be defined by the Western society, not by the Harvard University, Oxford University, but your own local. Local people can make your definition. And at the same time, you yourself could make a kind of some the uh, bottoms up wisdom through your life, through your context. What, what makes me happy? For example, um, in Korea, there are many a, exciting dramas nowadays in Korea and probably South Korean people, everybody knows, there was a very um, stimulating a drama uh, which was called Sky Castle. Sky Castle is kind of some, the, a drama uh, the young generation like you would like to uh, enter the high level university. But how it is tragic. And even if you go to high level university, what happens? Usually they work for the money holders. Usually they are hired by Samsung or LG or Hyundai. And they have to put the, all the time for company. But where is their time? And where is their family time and gathering and their space? Life is not too long. The, and the planet is only one. And your local place is already there. Then, then, what would be our um, happy index? What would be our disciplines? What would be the components? What would be the principles that we had better uh, take in our life? So economic development, we have to rethink about. Of course, I don't want to, we go back to primitive a society again, but what kinds of economic development and what degree would it be really appropriate for our human size? So I don't know if this would be answered or not, but anyhow. <laughs> Thank you, though, Professor. Um, that was still very insightful, so we do appreciate that. Um, our next question is from uh, Bobby. Um, he says, hello, sir. Hope you'll always be fine. What is the best way to increase the friendship between the two countries without breaking the rules of this pandemic? You already do. You already do through this kind of conversation. Or, well, I think cyberspace, as I already mentioned, is not only tool, it is another new living space. So without COVID-19, you can build up your cyberspace over here. You already record and you can share and you will have another time as uh, such kind of things. Now this is a conference, but you can make a workshop over there and you can build up a new policy and as I already mentioned some people like to make a kind of some the happiness index among yourselves and you present and you just invite not only in Indonesia and South Korea, but you can make a kind of some the united a local, how do I say the global youth forum next time. So you can invite some other countries all together. Or for example, you can also invite a East Timor or Aceh people or Singapore or Brunei. And you also think about how ASEAN had better be developed. Well, that would be another thing that you also think about. So there are so many things that we have to rethink and to rethink or to reflect or to reinvent 
we need a kind of some the a discussion, a dialogue, because such kind of hard discussion or dialogue gives us a kind of some the new creative um, the platform and uh, ideas. So uh, you don't have to worry about rather, as I already mentioned, thanks to COVID-19, we found this kind of some the limit limited of this the cyberspace like like what we are doing now and at the same time local so we we found which we just forgot or we lost so we had a better revitalize such kind of things okay um thank you for the answer um our next question is from Mr. Chipta Di Akbar from Egi University. There are a lot of countries that are under recession because of COVID-19. What is Korea's way to minimize the economic problem during this time? Can the Korean method be applied in other countries? As we know, every country has their own differences. Well, that's, that, that's a very critical question and that's the most critical, the task that this government would like to handle because actually uh, this government would like to make kind of some the safe from pandemics. And at the same time, they don't want to have such kind of economic recession under this COVID-19. So actually a two different uh, goals. One is of economic the development and the other one is about the safety from the COVID-19. But it is not, it doesn't go all together always. So it is always very serious issues. So sometimes, um, when we just to make some more economic place, the market more free, then COVID-19 goes up. So now we, we are experiencing every day. But as I already mentioned, to, to make it more sustainable, I think the government, the consistent and transparent a policy and very prompt policy is very, very important. But this is not good enough. As I already mentioned, the local citizens, a participation, patience, resilience, and their some own self a, a protection. And at the same time, to let, I think the, the leadership to let uh, such local people can make their own a voluntary participation to prevent COVID-19 is the local government leadership as well. So actually the national government, the local government and people, all these three things could work together. So not only one policy is the only solution, that's not. So, so it needs a lot of some cooperation. That's what actually a, what happens in Korea, even though it is not sufficient, but anyhow, we are experiencing. Um, so I already mentioned, uh, people showed a lot of patience and resilience and engagement. Of course, sometimes complaints, but that's very stressful. So that's where we are now. Okay. Um, would that be all? Would you like to continue? Okay, I guess not. Um, so this is probably our final question because we are on a time limit for this Q&A. Um, this one is from Ninda from Unika Atmajaya. Uh, thank you, Professor Yi, for the insight. It was a very interesting and eye-opening presentation. I want to ask a question. Specifically in Indonesia, there are many youths and adults alike who are close-minded and would engage in damaging actions that encourage disintegration on a local level, such as actively discriminating race, physical youths, so on and so forth. How do we deal with this type of behavior in order to unite the local community. Thank you. Wow, that's very old old, um, and still happening and very crucial question. Um, well, I think the only way is that um, the first of all, recognizing education of, about those issues and then solidarity it would be the second. Solidarity in their community and at the same time beyond the community. So city to city, a cooperation and solidarity or solidarity um, community to community beyond the borders. Um, because even in South Korea, we had a very a long the military bureaucratic dictatorship regime. And that time we were very much suffered and I'm also that generation. 
Uh, but if we remember that time, um, we could have our hope and we could have kind of some strategy. And that time we could have kind of some patience because we are connected beyond the borders. In the sense, we do appreciate the global, the social movement, the activists and leaders, and, and they do not belong to the state. They, they really uh, work in their community and their locals. So we are very much, uh, we were helped by them. So I think Indonesia, not only in Indonesia, all over the world, I think there are so many corners that suffer with such kind of issues, human rights, etc. Then, first of all, once again, the education recognizing and the solidarity um, inside and outside. I think those things could be very, very important. And thirdly, um, we, as I already mentioned, we need a kind of some common vision. Usually people think about remember is about the past, but I think remember about the future is also very important to be remembered. So you, you, you will be a kind of some remember, not only national people, but as a local people, global people, regional people. So we need a kind of some remembering process. To remembering, we have to think about, imagine about the future and the future needs to be common. So how common future can be imagined and how the common future can be remembered and how the common future can be shared and how the common future can be cultivated. So I think such kind of things are very, very important. And I think that would be a kind of, so not only youth task, but also all generations task to be done together with, um, with the cooperation among the generation and beyond the locals, beyond the borders. Okay, well, this is <laughs> my last message to you for this session. Yes, that's completely okay, sir. Um, thank you very much for answering all of the questions. And I believe that would conclude our question and answer session for this time. Um, thank you so much to everyone for asking a question. And once again, thank you very much, Professor Yi, for the new insights and the amazing presentation. And now we will be returning to our MC, which I will be handing the floor back to. So Ms. Saskia, you may have the floor. Hey, thank you, Ms. Raihi Zafira. And thank you very much, Professor Yi Ki Ho, for your insightful presentation. Dear ladies and gentlemen, for the next session, the attendees are welcome to take a break for 40 minutes. Please note that after the break session at 12.30 p.m. Jakarta time and 2.30 p.m. Korea time, we will continue to another session, which is opening second session by Indonesia expert speaker, Ms. Adelia Surya Pratiwi. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please take your time to take rest. And we expected you to stay in the Zoom you don't have to leave the Zoom. All right, see you at the second session, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank Thanks. you very much. Bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you at the yeah. Thank you, everybody. Hello, so do we have a break until 2.30? Yeah. And then the today's event will end at 3.20 as a final mark. So 2.30, we'll start another session at 2.30 and the final session will end in 3.20. Uh, we are going to start again at 2.30 p.m. Korea time mm -hmm. and closing at um, 3 to Sorry, 3.20 p.m. Korea time. Okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome.
Hi, Bobby. Hi. Hi. We are going to continue to another session at 12.30 
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Indonesia Korea Youth Friendship Forum 2020. How to bring your country in the middle of global crisis? Please, ladies and gentlemen, turn turn on your camera because you are about to begin. Okay, thank you ladies and gentlemen. Now, we are going to continue to the next session, which is the opening second session by our moderator, followed by the next session that is to hear the speech, which will be delivered by the Honorable Economist of the Fiscal Policy Agency, Ministry of Finance Indonesia, Ms. Adelia Surya Pratiwi. Without a further ado, I would like to hand over to the moderator, Ms. Raini Zafira, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ms. Saskia. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our second session of today. We will be hearing from another expert speaker with the topic discussion of COVID-19 and Indonesia's economic recovery. Prior to COVID-19, Indonesia has had one of the fastest growing national economies in Southeast Asia. However, ever since the pandemic hit, the country has suffered a fair amount within their economic sector, with monumental changes in the medium of labor leaning heavily towards technological-based work. This, of course, has affected the economy of Indonesia that was previously manually based. Over the past few months, we have seen the well-being of Indonesia's economy slowly deteriorating, showing how fragile our actual economy is. Seeing this current condition of Indonesia's economy, the question of recovery has been on the mind of many. Many have stated that Indonesia's economic recovery will be the defining factor of the country's economic well-being for the next few years. Today, our second expert speaker, Ms. Adelia Surya Pratiwi, from the Fiscal Policy Agency of the Republic of Indonesia will talk to us a bit about the country's recovery and show us some insight on how Indonesia's economic state can be rebuilt. Ms. Adelia Surya Pratiwi is an economist of the Fiscal Policy Agency, or FPA for short, at the Ministry of Finance for the Republic of Indonesia. She is currently the Head of Public Communication Strategy and Management at the FPA, where she formulates a media platform, media relations, and education. Prior to being head of public communication and strategy management at the FBA, he also worked at Malaysia as a consultant from our office of the He produced macroeconomic trade, investment, and poverty-related analysis to the World Bank, including Indonesia's monthly economic report to the office of the president, the Indonesian Economic Quarterly Report, and the 2017 Equity Analysis for Indonesia. During the he made many significant contributions to public economics and finance. He has published media in Indonesia, such as the Jakarta Post, Gramedia Pustaka Utama, and others. He earned a master's degree in international money and banking at the University of Birmingham with the contributing students and a bachelor degree in econ economics at Universitas Indonesia, and a diploma in taxation at Sekolah Tinggi Akuntansi Negara. She has been a lecturer for D4 Financial Management Program at Sekolah Tinggi Akuntansi Negara. Before I welcome our speaker, I would like to remind the audience once again that you will be allowed to ask questions to Ms. Pratiwi. This can be done by typing the question in the chat box or by using the raise hand feature during the question and answer session if you would like to ask a question directly to Ms. Pratiwi. And now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming our second speaker of the day, the Honorable Ms. Adelia Surya Pratiwi. Ms. Pratiwi, you may have the floor. You have 15 minutes. Okay, it seems that Ms. Pratiwi is joining us right now. Um, Ms. Pratiwi, can you hear me? Yes. She's already...
Okay, um, please hold. Uh, hello, Ms. Pratiwi, can you hear me? Hello, yeah. Um, yes, hi, Ms. Um, I was just, I have just finished introducing your profile and I was just going to introduce you and you had just come on time. So um, now would be your speaking time since I just welcomed you. Um, so you may have the floor. You have 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Raini. Is that, is that correct? Okay. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you guys, uh, Indonesian Youth Foundation for inviting me to speak in this event. Um, it's really an honor to speak with uh, how many of you are here? 123 of you, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a really good time then uh, uh, to, to speak about the economic recovery potential in Indonesia in the coming in the rest of 2020 and of course uh, the approaching uh, year to come 2021 um i would like to share my screen now okay um so i would like to begin my presentation by um i think it's a good time to a uh, little bit reiterate uh, what what has happened uh, this year because we're approaching 2021 soon uh, and I would like to recall a bit what what happened in the beginning of the year when uh, COVID hit every country in the world and it has impacted uh, many lives and also livelihoods. We, we can remember uh, at the beginning of the year um, in just like three months, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, the COVID hit uh, the world first in the end of 2019. And then all of a sudden, uh, February, uh, end of February, it, it hit uh, the first outbreak was uh, beginning in Indonesia. And it has changed uh, everything. We were talking about economy, then we're talking about the pandemic as well. So uh, when you're talking about economies these days, uh, they will talk about some like uh, like a, like a health specialist as well. So because we we are uh, not only monitoring the economic uh, indicators day by day, but we're also monitoring the uh, development of the COVID case. So everything really changed in just very short period of time. Everybody has uh, has never uh, occurred the, uh, the same thing before. So uh, it's a very extraordinary situation. If, uh, if you remember, every, everybody uh, kind of um, think that the, this pandemic is similar to what we call uh, the Spanish flu that happened uh, hundreds of years ago. But uh, we didn't really uh, know uh, how to handle this time because uh, there, is, there is no sort of institutional memory, there is no journals to read, nothing. So it was... Uh, a very extraordinary situation that changed uh, overall the landscape of everything, not only the economy, but also social and everything. That, that was just a, a bit of recalling uh, the, how, how extraordinary it was. Even uh, I'm from the Ministry of Finance and the budget was changed really drastically in, in, in only three months. You can imagine, uh, we already came up with the 2020 budget, the fiscal policy was set to go for 2020 and then Suddenly, the the pandemic hits, and then it uh, it has changed uh, the, all the uh, components of the budget. Now, uh, this time, uh, I would like to begin the presentation by uh, reminding you that uh, before COVID, it was uh, it was pretty uh, good condition for, uh, for the global economy as well as Indonesia. Although uh, challenges remain, but it was uh, it was a good hope uh, we began the year with a good hope we can see the figures here 2019 we are familiar with five uh, percent of GDP growth which usually is uh, uh, indicator for our economic development the gross domestic product growth so you can see here in the uh, in the left part of your screen 
there is a GDP growth uh, numbers in the last five years. We can see you're familiar with 5%. And now, as all, you can see in the newspapers, uh, in all, all the medias are reporting, everybody's uh, reporting it too in social media. Uh, we, are, we have to uh, be satisfied with growth, uh, negative growth, yeah. Uh, we just um, had a release uh, just a few weeks ago and it's uh, around 3%, yes, 3%. So our economy contracted by 3%. And it's, um, it's, been, it's been a really uh, loss for everybody and Indonesia is uh, not an exception. Uh, so this is uh, how it looks like. From, uh, usually have, uh, we usually have to compare uh, some estimates from, um, from few international organizations like IMF, OECD, and the World Bank. They all uh, have this uh, sort of uh, releases uh, um, of economic production every quarter, so you can check it out. Uh, it's 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 available online, and they are also doing a public event uh, where, where uh, media are are welcome in those events. So here you can see that uh, there is a very dynamic condition. In 2019, the global uh, economic growth was uh, at 2.8, and now it's contracting. Maybe it's contracting. Two times, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, I think twice as big as its economy. So, so uh, it's almost uh, two times the size of the economy that we are losing now. So, um, in the in the left part, you can see the IMF projection is uh, contracting 4.4 percent. Well, initially they have a projection at 3 percent. So you can imagine 3 percent becomes uh, now it's uh, minus. 4.4% in 2020. In 2021, we can see that uh, all of these or international organizations are expecting a recovery. For example, in 2021, IMF is uh, projecting the world is going to recover at 5.2% and then OECD 5% and World Bank about the same as well, 4.2, uh, uh, a little bit more uh, pessimistic. Uh, what about Indonesia? Indonesia is also uh, sort of mirroring the world uh, trend. So you can see here so many forecasts are quoted in this uh, presentation, for example, including from my institution, Ministry of Finance, and then IMF, Bloomberg, World Bank, OECD, ADP, all compare that. But we sort of have a similar, similar sense of what's going to, what's going to happen in, in the year uh, 2021. We're, we're expecting recovery because we are, uh, maybe a few months ago, we didn't really talk about the vaccines development yet, but now uh, as uh, the COVID hit, uh, as the COVID uh, vaccines are uh, developing everywhere, and we, it's reported also everywhere, we can see, say, safely say that there will be a recovery, but for what magnet, the magnitude of the recovery is not really, uh, you know, we're not really sure about that yet, and uh, we're just hoping that it would be uh, some kind of bouncing at least to uh, the business as usual, to the level before the pandemic. So if you, if you see your 5.2, is it, is it uh, something uh, extraordinary? No, it's just um, probably going back to where we were. So uh, it's, it's still a loss for uh, overall the economy for this year and next. So in terms of uh, comparison, so if, if you're wondering if Indonesia's economy is performing well, it's not performing, but nobody is performing well these days, but if we compare it to other countries in the world, uh, as you can see, I, I highlight the Indonesian figure right here. Uh, Indonesia is compared, uh, is relatively mild. The, the impact of COVID to Indonesia's economy is relatively mild compared to other countries. As you can see, other countries are suffering a lot more. If you, if you want to, uh, the perfect comparison will be to our neighboring countries, for example, um, uh, there's Thailand there, Singapore, Malaysia, their, their economy are all contracting. So you can see uh, Malaysia in um, port from your right, uh, your left, uh, they're uh, contracting about 6%. You can imagine 6%. 
usually they uh, they have uh, growth that is um, of course it's 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 higher than that but uh, you can see that they, they are contracting really really uh, bad and Indonesia is somewhere that we call we can call mild and then uh, what about the response the response of uh, the economic uh, I would I would not call a crisis. This is an economic recession because uh, it's uh, it's it's a long period uh, slowdown in economic activity. That's what I would call a recession. So if you see right here, uh, we are comparing economic trajectories with uh, the response of uh, government. So in your left hand side, in in the bottom. You can see there is a IMF projected fiscal deficit of various countries. Why are we talking about fiscal deficit and we are comparing it to the economic growth? Because you can see some kind of um, you know uh, counter cyclicality. Uh, what I would mean by counter cyclicality is that uh, when economy is contracting, there there comes uh, nobody else is spending. That means nobody else is spending. The the uh, citizens are not spending, and then. Uh, the, the government has to step in, so uh, government is the only one uh, that spends during an economic recession or economic slowdown. That's why we are comparing these uh, two graphs uh, all together in one uh, one slide. So you can see that the Indonesia is um, implementing what's called the fiscal uh, stimulus. Fiscal stimulus uh, that also been implemented uh, by other countries in the world, like. Here I, I quote China, India, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines. Everybody was doing uh, some kind of extraordinary measures to tackle the extraordinary virus. Uh, we have seen uh, everybody is doing a lot, uh, very high deficit, uh, the, the, the governments. We can see Malaysia here, for example, they are used to, the, uh, used to have the deficit at 3.7%, but now they have 6.5% of GDP. Uh, the size of fiscal stimulus. Yes, and uh, we uh, also see Philippines right here. It's it's very huge gap between the previous deficit before uh, the deficit before COVID 1.8. Now the deficit is uh, uh, going to be 8.1 percent. What about 2021? 2021, everybody is still. Uh, going to need the government to spend more to help the economy uh, so that uh, we, we see the, the trend that it, it's still expanding it's still the huge deficit it's not normal deficit for everybody China India Malaysia Thailand Philippines all the same they, they have uh, larger than usual deficits uh, for us it's uh, beyond the fiscal rule if you know the fiscal rule is like uh, the cap that we we can only have uh, maximum 3% of GDP. That's the fiscal rule. And we go beyond that because this is extraordinary situation. And then uh, uh, because of the recovery that is going to be uh, happen, going to happen in 2021, then Indonesia, uh, the fiscal deficit is, is uh, uh, a, bit, a bit of uh, going down to 5.5%. It, it happened, uh, the trend, the similar trend happened also to the other countries, like India is also uh, smaller, the deficit is smaller in, in 2021, in terms of percent of GDP. So if you, if you uh, happen to learn economics in, in your, <laughs> uh, your maybe master program and, um, or undergraduate program, you probably remember that economy, the activity of economy consists of uh, what the what the people spend, and then what the government spend, what they invest, and then what, what the export and import. So here you can see that everything is contracting, but uh, the government expenditure is the only one uh, driver for Indonesian economy. You can see government expenditure right here uh, in in the table uh, in your right hand side bottom. It's, go, it's, it's going to be uh, having a growth of 9.8% uh, in the quarter three. And the 2020 outlook, is, uh, it's between 06 and 5.2%. You can imagine 
the economy is contracting, but the government expenditure, the, it has to, is to be the spender, it has, has to support the economy. So that's why it's, uh, it's going to record a positive growth. But uh, as we have uh, talked about, uh, we are seeing some good developments because uh, the, we, we seem to be able to, uh, some countries actually, uh, has uh, successfully, you know, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say successfully uh, per se, but uh, at least we have seen some good uh, developments. The, the COVID okay. new case growth, for example, uh, is kind of flattening in, in some areas, probably in Indonesia also, that we, we uh, can reopen the economy a bit. So you can see here the economy is uh, rebounding, sort of rebounding. There is a trend of rebound. Really, really hungry. The yeah. level. Uh, if you if you are familiar with um, many news, many economists talking about uh, V-shaped recovery, this is this is what they actually mean. So we are expecting uh, a, a V-shaped recovery. It's going at least uh, back to normal. Uh, this. Uh, this indicator is uh, one of the real economy indicators, so that's why I'm quoting it right here. So you can see there is a V-shaped recovery uh, everywhere, but it's not yet stable. So you can see Indonesia right there, it's already coming to uh, the previous level. So the ideal level is 50, that means the real economic activity, the manufacturing activity is going back to uh, positive growth. That's what 50 means. But uh, Indonesia, uh, as you can remember, uh, uh, Jakarta province, uh, it was um, well, uh, it was uh, doing you know a measure to tackle the pandemic. Then we we so called uh, that, that social distancing kind of happen again after it was uh, sort of uh, not in place anymore. But it was applied again because of the rising COVID case. Then. It, it, it become uh, uh, counterproductive to the uh, manufacturing activity, but we are hoping that it will go back. And then this one is uh, what we call the, you know, the, the indicator of price. Usually price uh, represents something um, uh, that relates to the global demand. So if the price is uh, for, uh, about right again, that means that the demand is slowly recovering and as well as the supply. So you can see here, there is a sign of recovery after uh, in, 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 in the past uh, few months, it's going up again, the global price. That means probably demand and supply uh, are recovering. And then these, uh, I'm going to just touch because uh, I know that my, my time is uh, limited. So uh, I'm seeing in all those slides that there are some uh, sort of uh, good developments in, in the recent months because of, so the transmission goes with, from COVID development that is progressing quite well, and then uh, vaccines development and all that, and it becomes, uh, it, it increased the uh, con confidence of the business and also the government. Uh, to re reopen the economy, that's why uh, it's it's uh, it's been progressing quite well, and our economy is uh, going to uh, recover. Although not yet, uh, you know, uh, to the previous level because our previous level is quite high, five, and we are now contracting at uh, minus three percent. Uh, anyhow, the, this is uh, the uh, coming to the fiscal response again. So as I already talked about, we are, uh, as a government, government will be the only spender in the economy at this time. So we are going to have a deficit at 6.34%. Well, uh, the previous one is 1.76%. So you can imagine it's a lot more than what we expected to happen in 2020. But it's, uh, it's not something you should worry about. You, what you should worry about is that the money is going to be spent well, well targeted uh, and in time. So uh, you're going to help the people in need in time. So that's what you should worry about. Is, is, is the program design already implemented in such a way that it, it, uh, it benefits the right people, the right amount and so on. So you should worry about that, not about the level of the deficit. As you can see, uh, other countries also have 
same trend of uh, widening deficits. Um, here, what I would call as the design. So I was uh, I was talking about six point seven eight thirty four thirty four. Now uh, it's the time to uh, for you to worry, yeah, because this is uh, where the critic should uh, be directed to. So this is uh, national recovery programs uh, in Indonesia. It, uh, it is a huge part of the uh, fiscal uh, policy because this program is uh, dedicated to help to support the economy as well as, of course, uh, uh, to tackle the pandemic by uh, doing the health measures in the uh, left-hand side. But you, you, may, you may be wondering, why is this program very big on the economy side? Why not all spend on the health side? Uh, I, I heard that question a lot, and I would uh, like to give a context of why you shouldn't. Uh, I mean, it's okay that you ask that, but uh, the, the the idea is not about economy is more important than health or uh, or uh, or the like, but it's it's more about um, how we are seeing the economy is impacting the livelihoods of many many people are going to. Uh, lose their jobs, they already did lose their jobs, and then uh, so uh, not only the you know the relatively poor people, but also the aspiring middle class that they, they go to uh, they go to cities, they work, they are far from their family, they have to feed the kids. Oh, we have seen uh, you know more people, more more clusters of people to help. Not only the poor people, the vulnerable ones but also the aspiring middle class. Probably they were doing well, but now they're doing uh, really, really bad. And let alone the new newcomers to the, to the, to the uh, to, to, to jobs market, right? So you can see all those uh, we have to help. And that's why uh, the program is uh, de uh, designed in such a way. So this is health uh, expenditure. It has, it will, uh, it is allocated at 87.55 trillion. Uh, basically, it's uh, going to be spent on uh, expenditure for COVID handling, and also uh, this is a new thing for us. We are giving out incentives for uh, paramedic because they are, uh, you know, they 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 are the the cure <laughs> they they are they're the one that uh is fighting i mean in in the, in the uh, curing position so that's why we are giving out the reward sort of reward for the paramedic and the rest is about uh supporting who uh, social protection that means we are supporting the poor and vulnerable ones that's why it's in the term of uh cash or transfer or in the term of food basic foods and then uh, some kind of uh, training incentives like Kartu Prakerja and then uh, electricity discount and then uh, other form of cash transfer so, such as the through the future. These are all targeted into uh, to the poor, uh, poorest and most vulnerable ones. Uh, and for unemployment benefit, it, it's actually also targeting the uh, aspiring middle class. As long as they are uh, not in the jobs, uh, they are they are out there in the jobs market searching for work. Uh, and then the rest, it's it goes to uh, the people also, but using different uh, different methods. So we're giving out to people because uh, uh, through uh, sectoral and regional governments, for example. Here we can see uh, the regional government are going to be supported in uh, maybe you know uh, different areas. For example, tourism here. You can imagine uh, that the travel ban happened uh, across the world and it has impacted uh, some regions very, very badly. Maybe we can uh, write a waypoint at Bali region, the tourism because it's really uh, you know, depending on the tourism activities. That's why the, some regions like Bali is going to be helped uh, uh, specifically by, by specific funds like this uh, cluster of sectoral and regional government. And then business incentives is going to help uh, the businesses in needs. And then uh, I, would, I would call this as, you know, uh, is helping the, their cash management. So now 
when you don't have any revenues, but you're still, you still have to pay your bills, like your tax bills and all, uh, the government is helping that part. So uh, they are waiving uh, the, the responsibility of those businesses because uh, we know that their revenues are not uh, as before, the same as before, it's contracting. And that's why we are giving out the incentives in the form of uh, tax relief. And then here is the SMEs, as you know, uh, small, medial, small, medium enterprises account uh, for, I think, 99% of uh, Indonesia, Indonesia's businesses are micro and small enterprises. So that's why we have to help them too. And it's, uh, as you can see in the amount, it's as, as big as the business incentives. I mean, because uh, the, the, the most of uh, most of us, most of the entrepreneurs in Indonesia are in a small medium business. That's why we are uh, designing a program specifically for them. And then the right one is uh, corporate financing. We, we can't forget that uh, not only the small businesses, but uh, the big uh, the big businesses are also uh, uh, some some uh, some uh, parties to help because they also uh, you know uh, having uh, employing many that's why we are helping them at least not uh, to go bankrupt not to close their business at least they can maintain at a certain level that they don't have to uh, let go of their uh, employees for example so this uh, this is what we would call as the national economic recovery programs so uh, what is the output we're talking about we're, uh, we were talking about the amount that we allocated in the budget uh, so it means from your tax money and then for if you happen to uh, buy the um, uh, the bonds, uh, the retail bonds, probably uh, because it's, it's very small, it's very reachable. You can maybe some of you buy them, the government bonds. It's all for this. So what about the output? Where has the money gone to? So this is the, the output of the program. We are also uh, closely monitoring the output of the program. Um, I think it's uh, about once a week so this is a very interesting experience as well because uh, it's, it consists of many ministries many many ministries many people are involved in this program and we are doing it uh, from home <laughs> so you can see the challenge that's why we need to you know have some kind of uh, monitoring system so that we know uh, we have uh, an idea of where we are and where we should improve this is the health, social assistance, MSME supports, and you can read them, but I would point a uh, few, for example, the social assistance. Uh, social assistance is something that we, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the program that is, uh, I would call as the most, uh, you know, in need. So it's, it's ready to be implemented. Uh, because uh, before the pandemic, we, we already developed some kind of, uh, uh, you know, da data data management we know by name by address uh, the bottom 40% uh, bottom 40% in terms of uh, income yeah uh, bottom 40% and we are giving uh, the assistance right away through uh, some sort of uh, you know uh, a card uh, card to uh, that, that that we can you know just step probably for the food allowance and so we, we sort of have the 40%, uh, bottom 40% data. But beyond that, we are developing uh, new, uh, some kind of new programs. They're like, you know, the assistance Jabodetabek. This is uh, something that we do. We have to collaborate with the Ministry of Finance. I have to collaborate with uh, uh, social ministries as well as the, you know, uh, the, the local government because we're giving out uh, cash transfer based on uh, your data in, in, in the like uh, your your ID, <laughs> your ID, your national ID. So we, we are really in the middle of a situation where we don't really have so much control. We have to work, minimize contacts, but at the same time, we have to deliver to that many people in Indonesia. So there's a challenge. But you can see here, the, the output has been, uh, uh, has been in uh, place in this slide. Uh, 19.4 million families have received the food card. 31.4 million households have received electricity discount, and then uh, so on and so forth. The tax incentive, as you can see, uh, it has been uh, benefiting many businesses.
also. You can you can all go back to this slide. I'll give it to you. Uh, and then in terms of the the budget, how how as I said, it's really hard to spend when you are uh, very really constrained in terms of uh, right now we are minimizing contacts. So uh, the 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 government is also uh, struggling in in doing their their job. That's why uh, we saw, uh, maybe you, you hear about our president was, uh, you know, uh, holding a cabinet meeting. He was, you know, uh, pushing, sort of pushing uh, the ministries so that they, they work uh, faster because we, we didn't really have the data before. It was hard. We minimized context and now uh, we see progress. So by, uh, by you know, uh, uh, having more experience, we are now in the pandemic for what month? Uh, like nine months. That's about how long we have uh, been, you know, seeing the same table. Why well, it's not progressing and all? Now it's already progressing. And it's good. Uh, at the November fourth, the data is still at November fourth. Uh, the realization will be or uh, fifty four point one percent of the budget. You probably are wondering, <laughs> this is November 4th, and then the budget, uh, the, the program is only halfway there. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's something that are, uh, you know, that we see as a um, challenge, and the government is, uh, of, of course, doing, you know, like uh, optimization program so that we would make sure that the programs are delivered. First, delivered in the in the right target, and then uh, in the in the last uh, month, actually two months, yeah, uh, November is still here, <laughs> and then December, and then uh, we are going to uh, optimize the situation because it's still fifty four point one percent of the budget. The uh, the the things that we see as um, challenge probably uh, the timing, yeah. You can see the economy are already you know, uh, sort of probably a bit recovering. So probably there is a change in the trend of, uh, you know, uh, the implementation of this program. For example, if businesses are already running, then probably they are not uh, uh, claiming any more of the incentives and so on. So uh, you, can, you can analyze it that way. So here is... Uh, um, the one thing also that I would like to uh, mention in, in a few last slides of mine, my presentation. So this is uh, uh, something that is quite, uh, I would call it creative. Uh, maybe you know that uh, some, some, some international organizations are giving reward to our Minister of Finance because uh, few, few uh, I mean, uh, some achievements, including, I think this one, because this is, some, uh, you know, some, a scheme, uh, a collaboration that uh, really represents that we, sh we should do it together. We should fight this pandemic together. So this is a, this is a collaboration between Ministry of Finance and Bank Indonesia, because we saw nine, uh, the, the, the need, uh, what we need, to fight the pandemic is quite huge in terms of the monetary uh, values. It's really huge. That's why we do this scheme called uh, burden sharing. So for the very basic necessities like health, social protection, and uh, sectoral uh, and local government, we call it as a public good cluster. And that uh, we, the, the Bank Indonesia is going to tap in in buying the uh, bonds or uh, the financing of this uh, public goods with with a cheap uh, with a cheap um, price. So uh, I don't know if I'm not mistaken, it's like zero for the public goods, and then for the non-public goods, uh, it's it varies, I think. But uh, we are seeing this as you know as a mean that the government and other authorities like the central bank. Are doing uh, the, the are fighting the COVID together. So that's why this is something that uh, I see as uh, creative because uh, I, I I don't know if uh, I don't think I have seen this uh, in other countries. Now uh, this is actually 
my my last slide oh. so so probably you are you remember that um before COVID, we already uh, we we had so much hope for the economy. We were entering upper middle income class economy uh, in 2019, as was uh, announced by the World Bank by their standard, the standard that they determined themselves. Uh, so we we are somehow between the recovery, uh, some somewhere between the recovery and uh, continuing our reforms that we already planned before pandemic occurred. So these are all the areas that we would like to uh, see as, uh, you know, beside the recovery itself. So uh, I know that my topic is recovery, but I would like to touch on that 2020 will not be only about recovery, not helping out people in need because they lost jobs, because of uh, the social distancing measures that won't allow their business to grow. So this is also something we should worry about. So you can imagine being uh, living in this very important moment. You are now uh, in, in the middle of a year that there is like, uh, we are almost recovering from, from COVID, but yet we still have to think about other things. If you remember, maybe some global leaders uh, said this thing, we have to come out of the pandemic uh, with, with a twin challenge. Uh, we have to recover and we have to recover sustainably. So uh, this is where we should uh, take care of uh, the areas uh, so that we, can not, we, not, we don't only go back to the business as usual, but we go beyond that. We you know, uh, take care of uh, all the issues that we should have uh, you know, uh, handled before the pandemic. For example, we, we have to know that our, we are still in the demographic bonus situation. Demographic bonus, demographic profile will be a bonus only if we can absorb, we can uh, employ the newcomers in the jobs market. Now, uh, maybe many people are graduating from their college and then they are in the pandemic situation. And now, then we have to uh, think about how to absorb the labor force. That's why we, we are uh, going to the sort of the reform that has to be in place so that more uh, businesses are welcome. Not only the uh, foreign businesses, uh, but also the, nas uh, the national ones. So as you can see, we are doing something that would uh, accommodate more businesses to come to invest in our country so that uh, more um, employments are created for them so here you can see the human capital development in the right hand side in the bottom infrastructure development deregulation cutting uh, the rate tip and then economic transformation so these are all uh, efforts so that job create, uh, more jobs are created so maybe uh, at the end of these years uh, this uh, year 2020 you have also heard about the uh, the government efforts to uh, simplify regulations. Um, the big idea of this omnibus law is actually uh, to that to, to create more jobs and then to accommodate uh, more uh, employments for the people, so that the demographic profile will only be a bonus. This is really important because um, we we are we we cannot just you know not do anything we have to reform and this is such a, a big reform that as you can see in the right hand side the world bank fitch rating moody's and maybe some other uh, i think uh, asean also uh, did a release on uh, their statement sort of their position on uh, omnibus law and then this this uh, is this part of a reform effort if i were you uh, what i would worry about is not about the law but how it's going to be implemented. That's what you all should worry about. So, because this is uh, going to be a really a key, because we're going to get out of the pandemic and then what? We have to, uh, we have to uh, come up with ideas, we have to welcome businesses, we have to, uh, not only foreign, but also nationals. We have to build the economy in a way that it can absorb uh, more employment so that uh, everyone, no one will be left out. It's a shared recovery. 
So um, I would like to uh, end my presentation right there. I hope uh, it was useful for you guys. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, John. All right. Um, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. As a reminder to anyone who would like to ask a question, you may use the chat box or the raise hand feature. To summarize the presentation, um, Ms. Pratiwi has brought up a few points. The first one is that global growth is deteriorating in 2020, but is expected to pick up in 2021. Going into national problems. Indonesia is mirroring this global trend and going through a V-shaped recovery where the demand and the supply are increasing, as well as the economic recovery program taking into effect since the last two months. Indonesia is actually doing relatively well compared to neighboring countries such as Vietnam and Singapore. There will be a recovery after the development of a vaccine and businesses are expected to bounce back after this. In terms of the Indonesian government's response, the country has implemented an economic stimulus where the government spending is most of the national money. Currently, the government expenditure is the main driving force of Indonesian economy. In 2021, the government will need to spend more money in order to help the, the economy recover. There is a national economic recovery program that includes allocations of government expenditure in multiple sectors. This program has multiple outputs such as social assistance in multiple forms such as electricity discounts, food carts, subsidized wages, and tax incentives. In terms of the omnibus law, it is the measure that the Indonesian government has decided to take in order to create more job opportunities for the, for the Indonesian citizens. It is implemented because the economy affects everyone within the country and the government is aiming to help those who are vulnerable. Now we will open the question and answer session. First, we will begin with the questions in the chat box. And if anyone would like to ask a question directly to Ms. Pratiwi, please use the raise hand feature and we will open the floor to your question. And now we're going to go into our first question. Um, our first question is from Ms. Aninda from Unika Atmajaya. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Ms. Adelia. I have a few questions regarding the omnibus law. Because it has met with lots of backlash from people, I would like to hear how it would impact the economy from your point of view, despite of the backlash that it has received from the citizens. Should I address it right away or? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Reni, for reading out the question for me. Thank you, Anin Dewidianti from Atmajaya. Uh, yeah, uh, you pointed uh, the, the question correctly that uh, we, we are from, in, do not quote me as a BKF from this because this is my personal opinion, but uh, I would say the, the omnibus law has, is, is, is something that we have been uh, actually as an economist, uh, 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 I would say this is something uh, uh, we were waiting for. So something that we expect to happen because if you see the, you know, when you're talking about economy, then you're talking about the people. If you are seeing the demographic uh, projections in Indonesia, it's, it's really, it's really, really good. We're going to have a really good demographic profile, but but how are we going to utilize that demographic uh, profile if, it, if we are not doing something extraordinary? You know, because uh, this is uh, the time where we can think about uh, reforms. So uh, if you're thinking um, how to accommodate uh, a lot of talents that will uh, will come to the job market, then this is the way. You know, uh, because the omnibus law had an idea uh, that uh, the economy should. Uh, be reformed in uh, areas that would increase the competitiveness of the country, and that includes uh, and includes some uh, deregulation. Uh, because maybe this is go. I mean, the analysis has to be you know uh, you know by clusters because we we are seeing uh, the omnibus law has a lot of clusters. But in general, I as an economist, I see this as a you know uh, orchestrated. Uh, reform that will benefit the economy. Why? Because uh, we need to absorb uh, the the newcomers in the, uh, the the demographic uh, profile so that it can turn into demographic bonus, not the demographic disaster. So it has uh, it ha it will accommodate uh, the the new employments, job creations, and all. Because now we are seeing so 
uh, I would see Indonesia also uh, as a, you know a, in a competition with other countries and you know uh, inviting uh, businesses so that we can learn from them and then we can develop our own and so on and so forth. But at, uh, the foreign direct investment, for example, if we we need a lot of them to to create the new jobs because if we are only relying on the national uh, uh, resources, then um, I think it's not going to be enough. So uh, the foreign direct investment is uh, something I would describe as uh, a way, uh, not uh, we, 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 we can, you know, uh, uh, sort of discuss the terms like how you're going to uh, do the business in Indonesia. I mean, there are a lot of details on that, but on a general idea, the foreign direct investment is really needed for us to have uh, to go beyond uh, our capacity. As you know, uh, some countries are kind of uh, in this so-called the middle income trap. Middle income trap is a phenomenon, uh, I, I think you, you all are familiar with this, but uh, I would uh, explain it anyway. So the middle income trap will, will happen if we don't uh, do something so ordinary. Because, um, and foreign debt investment is one of the key to go beyond uh, our level right now right now we are already in the upper upper middle income class you can imagine yeah we, we are already in there uh, so we if we want to be the 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 advanced economy then we have to do something and uh, right now it's it's the time so uh, I would I would suggest all of you here is wonderful 129 participants to to go into the detail so see the clusters where where uh, i haven't do i haven't done any assessment on the for example on the um, the cluster uh, of the manpower cluster but uh, i i already see the for example the taxation cluster taxation cluster is is clear it's dedicated to accommodate uh, so that we 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 you know make it easier uh, uh, in terms of uh, the businesses so that if they want to do the tax related measure so it makes them more convenient in doing business in Indonesia so uh, we're seeing this uh, one uh, part of the uh, omnibus law as something that is uh, you know uh, going to be uh, with with the general idea so it, it's it it rhymes with the general idea but I don't know what we, about the other clusters but yes I think it's going to benefit the economy as we are, you know, it's urgent. It's uh, urgently needed because we, we want to have, uh, you know, we, we cannot just rely on our domestic resources. That's what I would, uh, you know, uh, analyze from the uh, omnibus laws. But it's, it's, it's hundreds of pages. Uh, I think all of you should uh, invest your time in reading them. If you're interested in the cluster of uh, the manpower and the employment uh, uh, section, then you should go there and then be specific. And then there is this cluster of uh, you know uh, environment and all that. So you can you can go uh, directly to the clusters. But I believe the overall the idea is that to create more jobs. That's it. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Miss. Um, our next question is from Satria from Mas Gajah Mada. Um, thank you, Miss Pratiwi. I'm really interested with your elaboration. What if the government itself doesn't gain the people's trust, even though they actually have a noble vision, which is packed with the various policies that you've mentioned before? Okay, uh, this is actually my area as well because uh, I'm currently uh, the head of communication uh, strategy subdivision in the Ministry of Finance. So I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. So uh, we, we, we saw that uh, it's a good thing that the, uh, you guys, uh, you know, so many stakeholders, the people are the stakeholders. So they, they are doing many critics to the, to the, to the laws. It's good because uh, that means you read that you care about uh, how it's going to affect Indonesia, how it's going to affect the people, how, how uh, the net effect uh, is going to be, right? So it's good. It's a good thing that uh, people are, you know, criticizing it. Uh, and, uh, but the people's trust is, is something, uh, you know, something we cannot, you know, um, single out this omnibus law as, as, you know, as a way to say that it, this is about government trust. Probably you, you can, uh, you know, you can see that trust, trust 
is already uh, in place in my uh, personal opinion we have seen uh, you know uh, investors for example other countries are you know recognizing uh, Indonesia and then we, uh, we gain the investment grade so there's there are a lot of uh, more real indicators uh, when you want to measure the trust uh, but as an economist, I would I would refer to such as that uh, the credit rating per, per, uh, perception about Indonesia, and then where, where the government already tried to manage the deficit under the fiscal rule. So the fiscal rule, for example, three percent, it's already below, and then it's it's all uh, uh, everybody notices it. I think in the international um, communities, at least they they uh, they sort of notice that that we are trying so hard to maintain uh, uh, the trust so that they keep you know they keep supporting uh, so uh, I don't know if any of you are the buyer of the government bonds retail for example but uh, I think last uh, last month if I'm not mistaken there was a release uh, by the Ministry of Finance they say that um, we that was the first time uh, we, we conducted auction of the um, of the government bonds uh, with a very low interest rate and people still bought it. That means people are actually, so many people care actually and, and trust the government uh, uh, to, to do, uh, to support the economy, to, to support the development agenda. So you can see for uh, more real, real indicators of trust. And I've seen that trust is in place and it needs to be strengthened, it needs to be maintained, and it needs to be uh, in place for We need to keep it, keep it that way, and then increase it, uh, improve it, you know. Because I've seen that uh, the real indicators say it uh, otherwise. So if you saw protests, uh, it's, it's, you know, you, should uh, you shouldn't overanalyze the protest. But it's a, uh, it's a bell, it's a, it's a call for uh, for us to for example then the omnibus laws is it is the government providing enough information to the public of the the information that they need and so on and so forth you can you know uh, have a, a bit detail on this uh, on, on where exactly the gap lies you know but if you see the overall uh, indicators of trust it's in place and i'm i'm really uh, hopeful about this because i've seen that um, for example uh, the millennial millennial generations right now uh, the government uh, bonds is like the the what beside the tax tax that the, uh, the taxpayer pay <laughs> uh, we we also uh, uh, you know, finance all these uh, developments using the government bonds, using uh, the debt, right? The debt comes from you too, you know, uh, and then you bought them. Uh, the the million, I would call them the millennial generations because this really accommodates to, you know, it's only 1 million or 5 million rupiah, if I'm not mistaken. So this is really something that we see as the contribution of uh, the, the younger generations that, that would, uh, you know, so many of us, and then we are probably somewhere between, you know, not really gaining in terms of income, probably we're, we're, we're still uh, relatively low compared to the older generations. But yes, uh, all of you are participating. That's why the retail, the government bond retail were bought. And that is trust, I think. So uh, for, the, for the protest, I think it's, um, it's a good critics and we should uh, really address them one by one, case by case. Uh, and not seeing that as, uh, you know, violation of trust. It's not. It's not that. Um, I think uh, that's 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 gonna be my answer. Right. Okay. Um, now we are gonna move on to our final question of the Q and A. This is from Fauzi from Indonesia Youth Foundation. As we know, in this amid pandemic, we usually use digital platform to do everything, such as studying, transaction, and many others. So how? Does digital economic opportunity and challenges in Indonesia show amid COVID-19 pandemic? Okay, that's really a good question. So, that make somebody is still blessed, you know, somebody is still blessed, some sectors are still uh, growing. And that would be easy to think. It's gonna be the health sector and then Got to be the digital sector because uh, digital now is the key to every everything that we do, right? Because we are doing schools, 
using the technology, we're doing business using technology, and then um, what else? Everything is, is done through uh, this digital technology. So that's why uh, the government, uh, I think I did mention, but really, I, I, didn't, I don't think I, 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 I haven't mentioned it, but uh, the 2021 agenda will include uh, a strategic uh, priority programs that uh, consist of uh, the infrastructures, especially the digital infrastructures. So uh, uh, that means the government is seeing the developments and they want to, you know, uh, uh, utilize that potential. That's why we are creating um, the environment for that. Uh, what is the environment for the digital economy to grow? First thing will be the infrastructure. You you don't want to be interrupted, right? You don't want your internet connection to be inter interrupted. You don't. But at the same time, you cannot pay <laughs> uh, uh, to to expensive price. That means the the scale of the technology has to be good and so on and so forth. But I I think uh, many of us already hear about the five G war technologies and so on and so forth. But that that is there is uh, a clear uh, a clear uh, view that uh, digital technology uh, will be key to our economic recovery you can imagine like uh, years ago uh, the uh, the pandemic now uh, creates a economic recession that is the worst in 150 years even after the world war the great depression the great depression uh, you know uh, made the IMF and the World Bank to exist in the world. And now the pandemic hits the world and it's gonna be worse than the Great Depression. You can imagine, right? So, so now, uh, now is the time for us to think about how to get out of this pandemic. And then uh, we, you know, uh, at that time, maybe uh, in, in the, uh, maybe the time where there were no digital technology there's no internet and then there's no gdp growth nobody is monitoring anything uh, they, they don't have any measures to uh, to know the idea of where the economy is right now you can imagine at that time we would only be dreaming of stimulating economy now because of the digital technology we can stimulate the economy without the technology we we cannot sell stuff and we cannot buy stuff. You can imagine that, right? How how bad it would be. And now the technology is uh, is in place. That's why we have to uh, utilize the potential. We have to make sure that our friends uh, there in the east part of Indonesia and uh, that are not touched by internet. I think uh, hundreds of villages are not touched by internet yet. We have to address that, and that that is that is the uh, huge um, you know. Um, part of the budget in 2021. That is one role of fiscal policy. We're going to uh, the environment and uh, I think for you guys, you should be on also cherishing this moment by utilizing your potential, how to connect to the world and you know, uh, do your passion, anything uh, using the digital. I think it's, it's a very monumental uh, time that everybody should, uh, should look into, not only the government, but also you as the, uh, you know, uh, us, uh, the people that 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 do, um, will be, you know, the buyers, the sellers, the innovators, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, for the fiscal side, uh, that in 2021 uh, there will be a huge commitment in uh, digi uh, celebrating the digital economy. Thank you, Rainy. Thank you, uh, Fauzi. Sorry, I was mute. Um, thank you so much. And I believe that wraps up our question and answer session for Ms. Pratiwi. Um, thank you so much to Ms. Pratiwi for the wonderful presentation and for answering everyone's questions. And thank you for everyone who has asked questions. And so now we are going to move on to the closing of our event for today. For this, I will be handing back to our MC, Ms. Saskia. You may have the floor. Okay, thanks, Ms. Raimi. And thank you very much, Ms. Adelia Soria Pratiwi, for your insightful presentation. I would like to thank you to all participants for participating in Indonesia Korea Youth Friendship Forum 2020. Before we end this grand webinar, we are going to have a photo session and fill the feedback form. We already sent the feedback form link via chat box, so please check your chat box. You have three minutes to fill the form. 
and this form is also for your attendance and e-certificate. So please write your name correctly for your e-certificate. Ladies and gentlemen, if you already finished fill the form, please give me your best reaction using the reaction features. To get the e-certificate, we require you to attend tomorrow's session, the second day of Indonesia-Korea Youth Friendship Forum 2020, which is, is a presentation from Korean and Indonesian group at 11 a.m. Jakarta time and 1 p.m. Seoul South Korean time. Okay, thank you ladies and gentlemen, fulfill the feedback form. And now we are going to have a photo session. So please, Miss Operator, help us to screenshot the screen. And ladies and gentlemen, please open your camera because we are going to have a photo session together. Okay, okay, let's take a picture together guys. And those all of you who haven't opened your camera please open so we can take a picture together but you have to notice that we have like five slides and you you will not know which slides are you so just smile just give your best style and i will give you some taking picture okay i will count wait wait for a moment yo hana the set Okay, that's the first pa page. What? Again, second page. Whoa, it's so long. What? Okay. One, two, three. Okay, why? Why? Just keep smiling. Just keep smiling, guys. You will not know which are you. Where are you? Okay, and then third slide. One, one, two, three. Okay. Then fourth slide. Wait. One, two, three. Okay. Wait for a moment for the last slide. Okay, and this is the last slide. One, two, three. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Uh, before we end this session, uh, let me inform you that you have to attend tomorrow's session, the second day of Indonesia Korea Youth Friendship Forum. 2020, which is, is a presentation from Korean and Indonesian group at 11 a.m. Jakarta time and 1 p.m. Seoul, South Korea time. If you have any question related to this webinar, please reach us at our Instagram at ppdc underscore Korea and at Indonesia Youth Foundation. Once again, I would like to thank you for joining us today. I wish you all have a great day and see you tomorrow, everyone. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Thank you. See you. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.
it was very meaningful and I was able to reflect back on the relationship between Indonesia and Korea. So that was very meaningful. So regarding tomorrow's program, oh, sorry for the noise, I'm at a cafe. So regarding tomorrow's program, oh, do we get to participate in the debate or do we just see other um, professionals having the debate regarding this topic? So do we get to participate in the debate tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, actually, Kamsamida uh, Nuna Sochakim for very <laughs> interesting. Uh, it's really wonderful and emphasized us too. And for tomorrow, we will have uh, such a debate too, which is open discussions. And uh, uh, there will be uh, four presenter, four group presenter, which will be deliver about economic and also tourism. And during the Q and A sessions, it it will be different uh, with uh, before Q and A with the Q and A before. It will have uh, some open discussions. It's a small debate like that. So there will be like different open sessions for debate, and we get to like participate to talk and share our viewpoints. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much, and hope you. Have a great day and see you tomorrow. You too. Okay, bye. bye. Bin, Gyeongjin, and all PPDC members, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this wonderful time. Me too. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Good luck fighting for tomorrow. Yes. Actually, there are some other participants who are staying in the room you may leave the zoom therefore you can prepare for the tomorrow's attendance thank you for listening Thank you everyone. Don't forget to come to the second day of Indonesia Korea Youth Friendship Forum 2020 is a presentation from Korean and Indonesian group at 11 a.m. Jakarta time and 1 p.m. Seoul South Korean time. Thank you everyone. See you tomorrow. See you.